Jonathan Gold is a former Celtic goalkeeper signed by Wim Janssen from Bradford. He would go on to win the League Cup or win the league when Celtic stopped Rangers doing 10 in a row. He only conceded 24 goals in that league campaign and has been labelled the unsung hero of Wim's successful season in charge. He played under five different managers during his time at Celtic, where he went on to win the League Cup under Kane de Gleish before winning a treble in Martin O'Neill's fourth season in charge. Hi, Jonathan. You're very welcome to the Celtic Soul podcast. You're now on the other side of the globe, where, where you are the goalkeeping development manager at New Zealand Football. How's things going over there? You seem to have come out of the COVID-19 after lockdown early. Is life back to complete normality? And how are you enjoying the current role? Yeah, uh, <coughs> normality, so I'm not sure that's always the case at the moment in this world anyway, but um, as, as near to normal as we can be. I arrived back just over a year ago. I had to do my two weeks in, in quarantine, which was pretty tough getting into a routine of um, seeing nobody and not, not even allowed to be going out in the hotel room. But um, that's why I think they've been so, so successful at keeping COVID out. Um, they locked the island down. And um, yeah, I, I would say in the last uh, 11 months, uh, we've led a pretty normal life over here. Yeah, you're lucky. We're starting to get back to some kind of normality here. Well, the Bear Gardens are open and I think we're I'm in Ireland and Glasgow's a little further ahead. So... They're talking now about getting back into football stadium as early as August, so fingers crossed, but who knows? We don't know with this new uh, variant. Now, anyway, Jonathan, we have a new Celtic manager, Andre yeah, Postacoglu. You've coached in Australia. Did you come across yeah. him? And uh, what's your thoughts on him? Yeah, I came across him on a number of occasions. Um, Teams usually got beat by his. Um, it was when I was at Perth Glory and also at the Wellington Phoenix. And uh, yeah, he's, the teams that he put together in a very, very short space of time were, were hugely successful. He took out two, uh, two uh, A-League titles here. He went a season unbeaten. Um, you know, an invincible team, which, uh, as we all know, is very, very difficult to do in any level of football. And... More than anything, it was his uh, style of play that, that really grabbed the nation. Uh, you know, he, um, he's, he's a purist, but he's, he's not daft at the same time. He knows there's times when you can play, there's times when you, you absolutely um, need to play a different way. And he had that good mix. And uh, the success he had, as I said, was remarkable over here. Yeah, were you surprised when uh, Sadler came in from? I think... Um, I think everybody was probably surprised. Um, you know, obviously, if you think uh, of, of Eddie Howe had been in the w uh, wings. I don't know, he hadn't been anywhere only for a couple of months and everyone expected him uh, to get the job. And, uh, yeah, so I, th I think there was, a, there was an element of surprise, but I don't think we should be surprised uh, given his, his CV. Uh, you know, for an English-speaking person to go over to Japan and win the league, uh, in the J League, um, you, you can't underestimate uh, that achievement. And I think that shows the metal of, of Ange. I know he's, um, he's going to be an uncompromising figure um, for people to deal with. Um, he, he's, he's got his method and he's going he's gonna to implement that. And if, I think if he's given the time, he could very, very easily have the same kind of impact that Brendan Rodgers had uh, with his style of football. Oh, we hope so. Oh, that would that would make us very happy, Johnny. Um, yeah, well, well, that's that's it, and I think I think that's what people mustn't get away from. Uh, and I, I think Ange said it in the press over the last couple of days. Every single person that supports Celtic wants Ange to succeed, and and that doesn't matter who you are, ex-player, you know, um, the man at the door as you walk into uh, to to Parkhead, they all want you to succeed, and and that's uh, that's what he starts with. Yeah. No. We are excited, but we're kind of a bit um, worried because he's so little time with a big Champions League coming and we, we signed a, a young defender today That's and Griffith yeah. has signed an extension to his contract. So that's, um, that's something, but I suppose we're a bit worried about who's going out the door because with such a leaky defence last year and you, you, know, you played in goals for Celtic, the goalkeepers this year didn't have, didn't have the best seasons. In fact, the, the Greek lad that came in had a nightmare. You were completely different when you came in. You had you'd probably the best season ever when you came to Celtic. <laughs> it was probably good timing. <laughs> I had a very, very good back four. Like you said, though, I had, um, 
you know, Reaper, Stubbs and Anoni in front of me. I had fullbacks. Um, you know, Stefan Mahe was had probably one of his best seasons in his career as well. Jackie McNamara and, Mara and Tom Boyd. You know, when you when you think of those names, um, uh, they were very secure. We, you know, we had uh, when Paul Lambert came in, he 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 was uh, you know that four in front of the back back line and and Craig Burley in front. We we were a very very solid team. But it took you know even that it, didn't, it probably took us three or four games to to get that going as a unit. Well, you know, we had a couple of issues early doors, uh, and Vim had to correct that. Um, but um, I, th I think what people have got to realise as well, it's, it's, actually, it's actually not Angie's fault that he's so late into this. Um, so that's why I think we've got to give him that time. And you're right, the squad at this moment in time um, does need a, a little bit of an overhaul. It needs uh, probably the spine of the team uh, renewing and, and, and hopefully he'll get the resource um, and the patience to do that. Yeah, as I said, you come in now um, from Bradford. You were... Yeah. In the reserves, I believe, and then like the pressure that season must have been immense because you know, to stop Rangers from doing ten in a row, it's it was the same for I suppose the Rangers players this season. Yeah, yeah, I I, I think it probably helped a few of us, Andrew, that we didn't quite understand. If you think um, uh, um, uh, Vim and Jock and Murdo brought in quite a number of players in that in that uh, window before the season started. There was myself, Reggie, uh, Stefan and, um, and Henrik, of course, and uh, there were probably a couple of others. And we didn't, prob we didn't come into the pressure pot as it had been felt over that period of time, getting up to nine. So it was something that we, we learnt about, um, but we hadn't been brought up with you know, in the season prior to that. So I think that helped us. I, having said that, uh, I'm not going to uh, hide away from the fact that um, over the next nine months, it did become uh, uh, quite pressurised. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there were moments, there were, there were periods during the season where, you know, the, the whole the league seesawed. And um, <clears throat> it, took some, it took some character from a, a group of, uh, of lads that got on very well together uh, to make sure that we pulled it off in the end. And when did, when did you become aware that Celtic were interested in you? It was, it was, it was actually... Um, uh, driven by uh, initially by an agent who rang me up on a about seven o'clock in the morning and said Celtic uh, need a goalkeeper and um, and are you interested and I was actually third choice you were doing me credit there Andrew I was third choice at Bradford I couldn't get in the reserve team at the time <laughs> uh, and um, and because I'd played for Scotland and bit worked under uh, Murdo McLeod. Um, when my name went in there, I think uh, there was some thought given to it. But I, I, I let I learned after the event that my agent actually didn't put me forward. He put Brian Gunn forward, and so it was only the fact that my dad. I asked my dad straight after the phone call I had. I said, "Do you know anybody at Celtic?" And he knew Jock, so that phone call went into Jock Brown, and really over the over the space of seven or eight hours, um, we negotiated a contract. I drove from Bradford to Celtic. Met Vim and the crew, and um, yeah, the the rest was sort of my history and uh, part of the club's history now. So it's pretty awesome. And did you like? Did you know much about what you were coming into? Because everyone yeah. thinks it's a big club, but yeah, there's a goldfish bowl at Glasgow. Yeah, I did, and and, and ironically, um, when I first came out to New Zealand in 1989 as a as a young player, we were on a we were on a a scheme where Wimbledon used to lend two players every year to, to a club called Napier City Rovers. And my father was the manager at Wimbledon. And he sent me over with a lad called Brian McAllister, who was um, a real strong left-footed centre-back left-back and who actually went on to play for Scotland as well. And he was a massive Celtic supporter. So I used to room with Brian and every uh, Sunday stroke Saturday uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning, our time. Sunday morning, yeah, Sunday morning, our time. I used to have to listen to all the Celtic games on the radio. So I was, I was, and he used to sleep under his uh, Irish flag, Irish flag. He was that mad, right? And um, that was my introduction. And we we also had a couple of uh, players in the team over here in New Zealand that were um, were huge Rangers supporters. So I, I got to I got to understand it pretty quickly at that age. I never dreamt I'd end up playing for the club. Um, but um, yeah, I, I did know uh, uh, the, about the rivalry even fourteen thousand miles away. No, oh, and that was the league cup. I suppose took some of the pressure off because there was silverware for Wim 
because as you said, the start wasn't ideal. He didn't really have a pre-season and lost a couple of games, but it was it was a roller coaster season as a fan, and I, I can imagine what it was like as, as as a player. But then, you know, it comes to that day in the sun, Celtic Park, yeah. full house, oh, you know, massive pressure. But yeah. you got the job done, and there must have been some must have been some celebrating done by you, because we done some celebrating that night and the next day. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, we were disappointed we didn't take it out at Dunfermline, to be honest, because that would have given us no, an extra, we. week, extra week of celebrating, you know. So I don't know quite how we'd have ended up after that that week. Um, as it was, you know, uh, you win it at, at, uh, at Parkhead in front of your faithful supporters. And, and one of the videos that I that I watch every now and then, and you, you see it um, every year, it comes, seems to come around on Twitter, was, was the... The video that was done really from a crowd's perspective and you can see the fingernails being bitten you can see everyone with you know folded arms really uptight really uptight and it and that didn't dissipate until that uh, goal of harold's went in uh, once that went in you could feel the the tension drain out of the stadium and then it then it became euphoric yeah and it's kind of fairy tale stuff like for yourself yeah. it, Within a season, you, you've gone from, as you say, Toad Choice of Bradford to, to becoming a hero. And as I said earlier, the unsung hero, because you only conceded 24 goals in that season, yeah. which I think was a record in the 90s for Celtic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I take a little bit of stick because, you know, people say, oh, the goalkeeper that stopped 10, and the lads always end up reminding me wherever they are in the world. That it was, um, you know, so it was just you that stopped ten, and it's not like that at all. I think, um, I think when you when you look back at that group and and um, how cohesive we became after those first two or three games that we had issues with, um, yeah, I, I it, the the mix of characters, the mix of ability, um, you know, we had some obviously had some quite brilliant players in that team, and and we had, you know, arguably Celtic's best ever. Um, number seven, uh, you know, and that's putting them alongside, you know, you know, Jinky, for goodness sake. Um, yeah, Henrik Larsson uh, was was a phenomenon for us, not just not just as a player, because obviously we relied on his goals, um, but his work rate, um, his his inner belief, kind of transferred into us as well. Uh, he, he's such a he's pretty stoic as a person, and it, it took a while to get to know him, but. Um, but we we loved them as a as a group of of footballers. Yeah, um, just on Henrik because, like, did you realise just how good he was when you know when he started out or Celtic? Or did was it evident from the start that he he was a bit special? Yeah. Or did it grow on you? You can tell. You can tell within the first five minutes of a training session usually um, how good a player is, and a lot of that. Um, from Henrik's perspective, was his movement. Um, you, you can have the skill, um, you can have the ability to finish in front of goal as he did, but it's his movement that got him into those positions. And and you know he need to he knew how to uh, pull a defender out, make that that dart across. Uh, he he knew he, he kind of had this telepathic ability to know that when a, a, someone got into a wide area where he needed to go in respect of where that cross was being delivered from. Um, you know, whether it was a, whether they got to the byline and he would just hold off for the cutback, um, whether it was a further out cross and he would probably hang out and then he'd rise at the back. You know, you can see him now when he'd get up at the far stick and hit the ball um, or whether he needs to get across the front post. And, and there was also, um, there was, there was kind of, there was a, there was a, there was a good feeling between him and Simon Donnelly at times as well. Simon would make good runs, but also he'd see, that run from Henrik inside the defender and used to play him in a lot. It was, you know, it's um, he was a joy to watch. And I was not, no one should have been surprised when he went to Barcelona and probably turned round a, a European Cup final in the last fifteen minutes. And that was because of his movement. That he, you know, he moved other defenders out of position for his teammates to to create space. Yeah, I think I think when you look back at you know the Barcelona players, they they really yeah. they really tossed so much of him, and that was a magnificent team. And you're right, he did. Came off against Arsenal, and we've spoken about it before in the podcast. You know, and he was involved in the two goals, and 
suppose he, you know, if anyone deserved a, a European winner's medal, it was yeah. Henrik after yeah. the, the disappointment of Seville, where he, he scores twice and still loses. <laughs> and we, although we had a brilliant run and a brilliant week, but we were heartbroken that day. Now, yeah. another player that is kind of a bit genius came in the following season was Lubo, yeah. which was probably a highlight along with me. I'll be coming in with Dr. Joe. Were you surprised when Wim left so quickly? Yeah, we were devastated, and um, it's probably been documented about how you know how it happened, and um, we tried to stop it as a group of players. We um, I remember us being in um, Estoril, um, but we'd been taken away to play. Um, I think it was uh, Sporting Lisbon in a in an end of season game, which you know you don't want to play in those anyway when you've finished a season, let alone at the end of a season where you've just won the league. You just want to really relax, and and that was that was his last two or three days with us as a. Um, as a manager and, and as, a, as a group of players, we did. We got together. I remember standing in a lift and saying, right, we need to do something about this. And we spoke to, um, sent a letter through to Jock Brown expressing our, um, our displeasure that the fact that Vim wasn't being uh, encouraged to stay. But I think um, the measure of Vim was, although I, you know he didn't, want, he didn't really want to leave, but he knew um, or he gave the impression that there was a principle around it. And 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 we respected that as a group of players. We didn't like it, but um, you know we'd come to um, uh, really admire him as a man over that uh, twelve months. Um, you know, and I think the biggest thing was that he trusted us, and 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 obviously worked under quite a few managers as a player and and as a coach. But he he, I remember him only really saying stuff to me on one occasion about keeping my back four. Um, further up the field and and so for the for the rest of the season he he knew he just let me get on with my job and when someone allows you to do that that's that's a massive vote of of faith in you anyway and especially as a goalkeeper yeah and confidence yeah like and obviously he's a good that that whim's gone but the doctor comes in yeah. and i suppose the highlight of that season was a game that you missed which was the 5-1 <laughs> and Tony Warner up and low and were you injured then <laughs> yeah, I was yeah, I was injured. I think I, I'm not sure which one it was. It was either when I got injured to play against FC Zurich in Europe. I think I did my knee, and uh, Tony came in. But I remember being in the stand and and knowing what it was like to to uh, thump Rangers um, um, from a, a supporters' perspective on that day. Um, and you're right; it was probably the the birth of uh, Lubo Mravchik, and again, um, you know, an amazing talent. And and even though he was a, a little bit older, uh, he still had the ability uh, to turn the game on on a sixpence and did it on a number of occasions for us. Yeah, he was a magnificent player, magnificent to watch, and and he had great longevity as well. Because when you think he played through right through to O'Neill, and I know he used yeah. them, he used him sparingly at times, but magnificent yeah. to watch. And another player that came in then was Mialbi. Now, yeah, you spoke there about the the back the back four yeah. that. That was there when you come in. Now, if, yeah. Obviously, Martin played a back three. If you could pick a back three or, or a back four out of all those players on the, all those managers, is it a hard job or, or does a couple of players just stick out that you would pick to have in front of you any day in a big game? Yeah, for kind of different reasons as well. Um, I love the fact that Mark Reaper was six foot four and could head a ball. Because uh, it, it do with him this season, last season. <laughs> Um, you know, because when that ball's coming in your box, you want someone that's fairly dominant. I remember having Colin Hendry a couple of times when I played for Scotland, and you love have him in, in a certain position. I loved the fact that um, I had someone like Stubbsy encouraging me to actually roll the ball out, and um, so we could start play from the back. Uh, and he, you knew he had the technical ability. Um, and like you say, um, um, Dolph Lundgren or um, Johan Mialbi, or however you want to call him. Um, yeah, he was he was just a proper rugged defender. I quite liked uh, Johan when he played in front of the back four because I thought he um, he gave that defensive understanding and a little bit of added security. Um, but, you know, it'd be remiss of me to say because you know, Tommy Boyd played centre half quite a lot for for us when I was there. Um, you know, and, and Rico Anoni in that in that year was excellent. And, and I, I remember Big Malky Mackay coming in on several occasions and doing a fabulous job. Um, you, you, if you think of that, that you know, there was there was there wasn't a dearth of centre backs, and then we had uh, Jos Val Haran, even Ram. Ram
uh, under Martin O'Neill. But so it is really difficult for me to to pick a um, a back back four um, out of that. And I would go back four because I like two centre forwards. <laughs> you named uh, you named plenty of uh, really decent high end defenders that we've yeah. had, and um, yeah. was you know there's always a few slip through the net. And one that yeah. slipped through the net was under the next management team, which was yeah. the dream team of John Barnes and Kane yeah. yeah. And one, one defender was Raphael Shoy and Oliver Tebbley. So that was that was your two centre half. So you must have been on shaky ground in that net. Did I, did I, did I miss them out? Did I? Like, I'm sorry, I forgot them. <laughs> no, um, I just think they came in at those two in particular, Raphael. Um, Goodness me. I mean, the rumours were that he'd never been watched. He'd only been sort of uh, video scouted. And, you know, having been on the coaching side of things now for the last um, 15 years, there's no way you can sign a football player just by watching him on the, on the, on the TV screen. There's so much more to, uh, to the game and to, to somebody's um, ability to do a job. And, then, and that was apparently how he was signed. Um, and he, you know, for the kind of care, you know, he was, he was a nice lad, Raphael. I remember him us going away um, on a trip um, at, during halfway through the season. We went to Portugal, I think, and he is a good lad. I think Olivier, um, you know, he was, he was again, he was, was, he was a little bit all over the place, Olivier. He, was, he had some real um, ability, had pace, um, but um, I, I think, I don't think there was a gel between him and anybody else in the back. And you know who we've missed? We've missed big Bob Baldi. Now, come on, there's, there's not many better big centre-backs than Bobo. And, and I never used to argue with him. I used to just, if he ever had a go at me, I'd just say, yeah, you're right, Bobo. Yeah, I believe Tomo, Tomo hidden the, the locker. <laughs> uh, the, when he went for Chris Sutton, I believe. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, I believe so. He's uh, Bobo, my goodness, yeah. Man Mountain. Yeah, it's funny, all the, all the defenders you've named there, like the good, the, the good, the bad, and sometimes ugly. Um, <laughs> But just take us back to the doctor leaving and yeah. bands coming in because when I've spoke to players that played in that team, um, they're not very complimentary. And re- in, around this time last year, John done some Celtic podcasts and it, yeah. it sounded like he was trying to rewrite history in saying that he yeah. was he was kind of left out and bits and pieces like that. So. No, from your perspective, what was it like when he came in? With John? Um, <coughs> yeah. When, I, I think that the, one of the things that I can remember vividly is um, Tommy Burns, um, you know, our hero and, and um, amazing uh, football man and Celtic man. He started pre-season because um, cause John hadn't quite arrived. And I remember us being down at Strathclyde Park and and Tommy was putting us through our paces, and it was it was really tough. And um, it was John's first uh, morning or afternoon, and and uh, at the end of the of the running and all the body circuits we did up on the top of the hill in Strathclyde, we came together as a group. And John said to us, um, he "said Look, um, you know, I respect everything that you guys have done at, at this football club, and um, yeah, you'll 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 all be getting your opportunity to show me." And I think, I think. The next day, he'd signed something like four or five players. You know, um, I know he'd, he'd signed Dimitri. Um, so he kind of immediately didn't have that trust in in what he was telling you. Um, and and I think I think what kind of let John down was, I mean, we had we had um, Terry McDermott was there, and um, and he obviously had Kenny in the background. But I think, um, I, I, I just think, and, and again, this is showing John respect because he was a most marvellous football player. And, and I played, I actually made my Premier League debut against John Barnes when he was at Liverpool and, and I was playing for Coventry. And, you know, if, um, I remember back, he put a couple of crosses in my hand early doors, which gave me a bit of a confidence boost. But so I, I need to respect um, John Barnes here. But I think the whole gig was way too early for him. And... And as much as he thought he had um, people around him um, that would help, and I'm not talking about um, uh, uh, Kenny and I'm not talking about uh, uh, t- Terry here, but I, th- I think he probably could have done with um, another mentor. I, I remember that um, 
Ray Harford was mentioned in dispatches. I know Kenny was keen to bring Ray in, but but um, you know John John needed a, a a lot more help, and and I'm, I'm not sure he was prepared to to take um, as much counsel as he should have done at the time. And and the dressing room, he lost it very very quickly. And never regained it. And when you talk about the dressing room, um, obviously, like he had a he had a, a very bad bad luck with Henry getting injured. Yeah, yeah. Out, you know, for all the season, he came back. I think the last game of the season, but then. No, the ICT game, which, you know, keeps, keeps, yeah. you know, we talk about the good times, but, you know, sometimes we have to talk about the bad times as well, which was, a, which was a bit of a disaster, to say the least. He lost his job the next day, and you played in that game. Yeah. And, you know, we've, we've had the stories about Faduka and, you know, that, the whole dressing room gone. Do you remember yeah. much of the build-up to that game, half-time and even after the game? Well... You know, the, the build-up to the game was that the game was cancelled from the previous uh, Saturday or 10 days before. And just because there was a speaker wobbling because the winds were higher. And you just wonder if history had been different, whether we'd have gone out on the Saturday and and um, and won the game. You just don't know. I, I <laughs> The whole thing had been coming, um, but it still wasn't that the players uh, were prepared to let that happen. It was just, it was one of those games that, you know, even even at half time, we were still well in that game, and I've seen the chances. I've watched some of the highlights back to that game in even the last twelve months because obviously the anniversary came up. And <laughs> when you look back, uh, we we should have got ourselves back in it uh, absolutely, but not to have Viduka on the park uh, for forty five minutes obviously had a, a an impact on on our ability to do that. Um, you know, and you know, I was talking about Mark to someone the other day. Obviously, he's, he's an Australian lad, and um, he was um, he could be very, very different at times. But um, he wanted him on the field, and 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 so I think that that's where I come down to the lack of experience. Where um, I I know that um, he was challenged, his effort was challenged by um, Eric Black, who was the number two at the time, and that's not always your number two's role. That's got to come from your manager. And I was the last person into the dressing room as a goalkeeper. You're always the last in because you're going to get your drinks bottle and uh, you're furthest away from the tunnel. And it was absolutely bedlam when I came in. <laughs> and then um, and it didn't get any better. And, and that was because uh, the manager, Reed John, at the time wasn't capable of, of bringing that group together and really focusing on the fact that we had to go out and be very, very professional for 45 minutes. Not just to... Not just to save his job, but to win a game that we we absolutely should be winning. Yeah, it was a it was a huge disappointment, but there was a small bit of light at the end of the tunnel for us as fans because we got. Um, I remember boarding the bus very early in the morning, in my hometown, <laughs> and we headed for Hamden. Uh, yeah. And we got over the line in Hamden. It wasn't it wasn't one of the, it wasn't the greatest final I was ever at, but yeah. no, it just it gave us something to celebrate. And yeah. like something to enjoy, and like, Tommy was back with the Gleesh then, and like two, yeah. two Celtic legends. And as we were, as we were stuck in Stranraer that night, I think we missed the boat. Uh, we we ended up getting a lock in in the little pub to live at four <laughs> in the morning. And chat. But you know, like, what are your thoughts on on Tommy and Doug Leash? Because the the two Celtic legends, like, and they've probably had yeah. two different paths because Tommy has done everything at the club. Whereas Kenny yeah. is remembered for his time as a player. Well, well Tommy knew what a dressing room um, and how important that dressing room was, um, and and you know his demeanour, the way he um, the way he treated people, and the respect that they had for him um, in return as a Celtic legend. And then Kenny, Kenny, I think they knew they already knew what the problems were, and therefore they were able to fix them straight away. I, I was. I was probably one of the first casualties because I'd fallen out with Ile Berkovich at the time and um, it was pretty public. Um, and and Kenny left me out and he came back. And he, but um, when I went to see him, he, he said, I, I said, look, I said, I understand why he let me. I'm disappointed. I said, but I'm going to get back in the team. And he says, you know, you'll get another chance. He says, just think that now's the right time. And he was probably absolutely, you know, he was spot on. And I remember then getting back in the team, and obviously that led to the to the final. And you just knew his his experience um, was capable of of turning it around pretty quickly. And uh, and it would have been interesting actually to see if if Kenny and Tommy 
um, could have gone on from that point and 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 made a good fist of it. I think they probably would have done. They were a good um, they were a good duo in there because Kenny could frown a bit and and um, and and Tommy could bark a bit, but um, you knew it was coming from a really good place. Yeah, I've, I've heard about Tommy um, losing the plot in Oibrox and because Tommy wore his hat and Steve when it came to, you know, he always said he was the he was the boy that got lucky, and he <laughs> he really like every time we do an interview or a podcast or you know people write for the for the fans you know if it's something yeah. on YouTube or just Tommy's name just comes up yeah. so much you know from the young and the old. Yeah. The, the thing is, Andrew, you only get lucky if you work hard and you're committed to something. And, and we all know that Tommy Burns was so committed to that football club and, and born out of that was, was, was what he perceived as lucky. Um, you know, um, yeah, oh, well, what can I say? People have said enough about it, or not enough. They, they say so much about Tommy Burns. And, you know, I, I follow his boy on, on Twitter now, Jonathan, and I think... Um, yeah, you know, he's kind of held a torch for his dad as well, and he doesn't need to. But um, obviously, he's he's getting some solace out of that. But um, um, I think that all the Burns family should be very proud of 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 Tommy and everything and his legacy, really. Yeah, and and he he hung around um, when Martin O'Neill came in, and and like yeah, like when Martin came in, it just things just seemed to, from a fan's perspective anyway, things just seemed to change because when we beat. Like well, the players that was came in, you know, Sutton, Tom will come in a little later. Hats come in a year later. You know, they were all you said, Bobo, useful Heron. They were all big, strong boys. Like you know, they were because th- there was you know there was the thing among us anyway was that we've been bullied by Rangers and I yeah. think saw that straight away and he, he needed yeah. to bring in some physicality. But like there yeah. was like not only did he bring in that, but like when he went to the wing backs. Like Bobby Petter was born again, and when you think back yeah. to the six-two game, that was Bobby's Bobby's great yeah. game. He was man of the match, and everything seemed to, to just kick on from there. And obviously, you know, you, you have a fair Henrik up front and Sutton playing yeah. off. And it was it was magnificent time. But you were there, and like then another another part of the fairy tale of treble. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he just thought that. <laughs> No, <laughs> Martin. Martin knew. We knew he was the boss the minute he walked in the door, Andrew. And um, and again, you get that feeling of of experience. And and they they say that a manager's sort of most important um, moment at club is that first two or three minutes when he meets the team. And that was certainly the case with Martin. He made it pretty clear um, that he was the boss, but also that he had um, an empathy towards us. Um, a respect, you know, you're talking about a guy that had won, I think, two European Cups himself. Uh, so we had him on a pedestal as a football player. Um, he'd worked under, you know, one of the most enigmatic uh, managers in the history of British football, in Brian Clough. Um, so he'd done his he'd done his apprenticeship as a player and as a as a coach. And you know, it was obviously a dream of his to come uh, to a football club like Celtic. I dare say. I dare say he probably wished he'd have stayed even longer. But, um, and again, that was, that was one of the main things that I remember from Martin was that uh, that, that first meeting with the supporters on the steps at, at uh, Celtic Park. And, you know, that, that, um, that always stays with me as a, as a player when he said he would do everything in his, in his power to bring success to this football club. And, and you knew he meant it and you knew he was capable of doing that. So, the, it was no surprise when he brought characters into our dressing room not, that wouldn't get bullied, and, and that was one of the, the first things we we'd said in his presence was that we felt as if we weren't going away from home and winning enough games one nil. Obviously, we wanted to score more than that, but one nil was kind of a perceived great result away from home in in any league, and and we knew we we had to do that more often if we wanted to turn the the tide and 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 make sure we we won won the league to to win the treble in that short space of time. Uh, was was remarkable, but it shouldn't really have been surprising given the the nature of Martin as a as a football manager. Yeah, a winner, as you said, you know, European Cup winner twice, and under Brian Clough, and I'm sure your dad crossed crossed <laughs> words with Brian Clough a, a number of times. But yeah. you know, it, we put Martin up on a pedestal, but he's also 
he's also the man that released you. Well, um, yeah, but I, I didn't, I didn't see it that way. I mean, you, you know, um, I suppose initially I was really disappointed, and um, but I just when he first came in, um, there had been a, there were a couple of teams that had were, were had expressed an interest. I wasn't sure whether I was going to start the season, <clears throat> and and I think that was probably the the, the the what he was all about as a manager. He wanted to challenge us not just um, as as players but um, as people, and. Um, he kind of laid that challenge down to me, and I think I played the first twelve or thirteen games of the season, and we were unbeaten. So I was quite unlucky to to get left out at that point. Uh, it had probably come down to a couple of little scratchy performances. Uh, one in Europe, I remember away in in, uh, in Finland, um, even though we won again, and um, and I think when we got beat by Bordeaux, I think um, again I didn't see myself at fault for any of the goals, but Martin just felt as if felt as if he needed. Um, a little bit more um, physical presence and went for for Rab at six foot four, but and he did release me. But I don't think I would ever change that three years, even though some of my um, um, my ability to, to to play was sporadic or his him, his, him giving me that opportunity, because I, I I actually think you're better off being being um, part of a successful squad than playing in a in a pretty average one and I was part of a really successful squad over three years four years then. so you know the travel season or the stop in the 10th season if you could choose one yeah. um, no I've, I've, I'd have to go back to stopping 10 really from a, from a personal perspective from a from a whole club perspective um, yeah travel is quite special um and I think the fact that that turned everything around for the football club when you look back um, and the players, I mean, the players that Martin bought in and that, you know, you, 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 you know, even as a player yourself, you, when, when players like um, uh, Sutton, Hartson and Lenny walk in your dressing room, it gives you a lift. You think, oh, hey, we're, we're, we, we have got a team here. Um, and it almost gives the, the 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 coach less to do. He knows he's got people that are capable of transferring um, everything onto a football field on a regular basis. Yeah, now you went in, in that January. Did you manage to make it to Seville? No, I didn't. Um, it was really weird that because I we <laughs> we were in our winter break, and I I'd taken uh, my wife and children to. Um, out to Spain um, just for a, for a week's break. And I remember a phone call coming through from, I was playing golf with my son, um, who wouldn't have been very old at the time. And it was Martin. And, and um, Martin was in Barbados, I think. He'd, he'd gone away for a week. You know, oh, how life's yeah. <laughs> and he just said, look, he said, um, he said, I had a club come in for you, Preston North End. Um, you know, I, I, if you you're out of contract at the end of the year, um, it's your decision if you if you want to go. And the, there was a financial aspect to it because I'd, I'd had a loyalty clause in my contract, um, I put in by Martin, and um, he kind of took the he took the financial aspect of it out. He made it um, a playing decision for me, and um, yeah, I just thought I need to go and play for the next two or three years of my career and that's that's what I did but I was and I was talking to someone the other day um, a player who was thinking of leaving a football club and I said um, this your football club is capable of going on a, a massive journey think twice about doing that and I suppose in retrospect um, leaving you know when we were probably three well we were three games away from a European final wasn't the smartest idea but it, it was yeah. There was bigger, bigger picture stuff, and and, um, and um, yeah, it was a shame because uh, I'd love to be involved um, in that 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 journey with the with the with the boys. But um, you know, as it was for the guys, it didn't turn out for them. Yeah, I was. It was a heartbreaking night, um, but yeah. a, a magnificent run, and a, we won nothing that season. But um, I suppose we won the hearts of. The people of Seville, because we had such a, a wonderful time, you know, they opened the doors to us, they opened the fridges and we drank all the beer. <laughs> you grew up in a, in a massive football family. Your dad, Bobby Gould, won the FA Cup with West Ham. 
And then he also yeah. won the FA Cup as a manager with the crazy yeah. Wimbledon and went on to manage Wales. So was it like, was it always, was the pressure to play football or did, you know, like, how do you, like, how do you grow up with, with like a famous football and dad? Yeah. Um, well, you have a great time, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> you know, my, uh, yeah, when you're the son of a footballer, you get a big garden. I had two goals at the end of each garden. That's where your football journey starts. Um, I used to go to, to all his games, even as a youngster. And dad had uh, 13 or 14 clubs in his career. So every couple of years, I used to have to change, change jersey, whether it was Wolves, West Brom. Um, I was a little bit too young for the Arsenal one. Um, um, <laughs> obviously, West Ham. I've got a picture out in, the, in my barnet here that, that, um, of me sitting there with the FA Cup in 1975 as a young kid in a goalkeeping strip, funny enough. Um, yeah, they were, they, I think um, it, my dad never really wanted me to be a, a footballer. He, he, he thought that um, there were elements of it, as much as he's obviously been in the game for his whole life elements that he thought um, were lacked security but um, I probably made my mind up by the age of 19 that, or 20 that was, that was all I wanted to do and uh, and obviously took that pathway uh, slightly differently because I, I went through the non-league route and came through the game that way but um, yeah I, 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 there's certain things that are um, innate and, and I think uh, sometimes character is one of those and, um, and that's why I think um, when things got um, poor for me or, or challenging for me as a footballer it was, it was the fact that I was the, the son of a footballer and the son of someone that had character himself that helped me pull through and and, and you know um, achieve success in my football career And we had the final at the crazy gang Yeah I was incredible well we'd gone to um, uh, he'd left Coventry not long before that and I was at Wembley the year before when Coventry beat Tottenham I was a massive Coventry supporter because we were brought up in, uh, in, in, in Coventry. My dad was a Coventry boy. And, uh, yeah, so then to go there the next year, um, I, was, I lived in a flat with dad that backed onto Plough Lane, um, as it was then. Um, and I saw firsthand for six, seven months uh, this crazy gang just go on a, an absolute journey. They, they, you know, you talk about... Um, tight groups and and people within dressing rooms that would not uh, give an inch uh, and I was lucky enough to be in those dressing rooms and see it uh, it was incredible and you you think they went into that final and they were I think they were seven to one against winning against the team Liverpool again uh, I think pretty sure Barnsley was involved in that game just thinking um, that. yeah a team that um, you know we're, we're about to take the double out and and um Wimbledon on the day were were immense, immense. Um, you know, one nil. Keeper saves a penalty, and uh, and you score from a set piece, which is your trademark. It was it was almost a perfect day for a for a Wimbledon supporter, maybe not a Liverpool one. Unbelievable! And you were born in England. Your dad manages Wales, and you yeah. play for Scotland through your <laughs> grandparents, who are from Lanarkshire. Lanarkshire. Yeah, yeah, my grand, yeah, my granddad. Oh, goodness me, he played for Blantyre Vicks. He was a pro footballer at the time. My great, my great, no, my, gr- my great granddad, I beg your pardon. Yeah. And, you, and like, you, you played twice for Scotland, if, if yeah. my research is correct. Yeah. But you also got to go to a World Cup. <laughs> that was a bit of luck. That was Andy, good old Andy Gorham decided that... Uh, um, he was going to go AWOL before the 98 World Cup. Um, I'd been over in Jersey for three days um, and celebrating with all the Jersey supporters because we'd obviously uh, stopped the 10. And, uh, and yeah, needless to say, I'd spent three days, not much sleep, plenty of alcohol, and then got a phone call to tell me that um, I needed to be on a plane to go to Washington to meet up with a World Cup squad. So I think I had a couple of days drying out and then managed to get uh, get myself back in a... Uh, uh, the zone of, of being involved with Scotland in a World Cup, which was um, it was a quite a quite a, um, an amazing way to end a year. But there is, there is a touch of um, the fairy tale about your journey because you started yeah. off non league. You know, you go to you go to Celtic. You win so much yeah. as Celtic, especially like two two really momentous seasons in in that. Yeah. You know, you go to a World Cup after you go on the piss with the lads. 
<laughs> I'd like to see that film. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Not sure I'd be allowed to uh, see see all of that film, but there you go. But uh, yeah, it's just it was it's it's been it's been great fun. I've you know you you are. I think that's um, you know Tommy mentions the word lucky. You you we are fortunate um, uh, to be involved in a game that. Um, you know, in a world is 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 sort of revered all over the world, and wherever you go, the Celtic supporters. It was the it was the it was an anniversary. I think it was thirty seven years for the New Zealand Celtic Supporters Club about a month ago, and I spoke to them on a Zoom link, um, and that's when you realise you won't go anywhere without finding a Celtic support somewhere. Yeah, I ran a festival in um, Thailand, a Celtic Supporters Festival, and we had all the Asian clubs in New Zealand, we had all the Aussie clubs, and it was ju- just at the start of COVID. So yeah. everybody arrived, <laughs> and within about five days, New Zealand went first, then Australia, then the Hong Kong, yeah. guys, and the last to go was the Europeans. I think the, <laughs> I think the boys that were based in, in London and in the Midlands, they were last to go home. We were even gone before them. So yeah, you, you'll, you'll meet Celtic fans everywhere, and especially if you played in um, iconic teams and iconic seasons, you'll, you'll always get a drink bar for you, I think, Johnny. Johnny, I always ask um, people to jump into my Celtic Soul toy machine and take us back to a moment or a match or an event yeah. that happens in their life. But since you're a, a Celtic player, you can take us back to maybe a moment in your Celtic career or also, you know, something before or after that just sticks out. So come on, jump in the time machine and take us back somewhere. Okay, I, I, I'm going to go back to the St Johnston game, and um, I can remember being told that because obviously either ourselves could, or, or Rangers could have could have won it. I think Rangers were away at Dundee United on the day. We were told that um, a helicopter would be waiting with the uh, championship trophy, and I can vividly see now Harold score and. And then a couple of moments later, seeing this or hearing this helicopter in the stadium. And that was when I actually realised that, that we were going to take the title out. Whether it was the helicopter that had the trophy in it, I'm not sure. But there was one up there. And, uh, and I think I can then... I remember coming for a cross and taking it really quite easily. And we, I launched it into the bottom right corner. And that final whistle. And... There was kind of a silence before there was an actual roar. We knew we'd we'd carried something out that uh, it was it was a mission that had been given to us as Celtic players, and and we'd sort of repaid the uh, our faith back to the supporters that followed us over, you know, over the life of the football club. Yeah, the the nineties were quite barren, and you know, with the exception of. Tommy's team winning the cup in '95, so um, we thank you and we thank all the players for that um, brilliant, brilliant day, yeah. and brilliant night, and you know, as the sunshine turned to darkness, no doubt the players <laughs> were celebrating as much as we were. <laughs> sure we might have had an earlier start. Yeah, probably saw you at some time, Andrew, and can't remember a thing about it, but <laughs> possibly, um, Johnny. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I've been trying to get you on for a while and you join a long list of goalkeepers that we've had in the show who have always entertained us. So all I can say is thank you very much for sharing your Celtic soul with us and taking time and I'm sure all the viewers and listeners will love it. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a, priv- been a privilege. Thank you, Andrew.